Hey, it's Laura Jane Grace. Are you in Chicago? I am in Chicago, yes. Well, thanks for taking the time to talk to us today. It's so nice to see you. It's been a while since you've been uh, here where I'm in, uh, in San Diego, right? It's been a second, yeah. I think I was at your coming out party here in San Diego. Wasn't that the first time you performed as Laura Jane Grace opening up for the cult? Is that, is that documented correctly? I believe so. It is documented correctly. It was kind of a, a little bit of a letdown of a show considering the, uh, the buildup that was around it, I guess, in that um, it was a seated venue, like everyone was in seats. So it was the first show of that tour with the cult. And uh, also then I was, yeah, feeling the pressure of like, it was the, my first show after I came out or whatever, but then to have everyone seated, you know, you just can't feel energy at a role show where everyone's seated. It is a beautiful venue and I, I do love it, but it's not exactly the best place to see a rock show, um, primarily because of the, the seating situation. And then of course, uh, I think they have a little bit of a volume control there that they do. And so I, I'm, I, lo I actually like going there, but like when you want to see Against Me or Lord Jane Grace performing or especially the cult, you want it to go to 11, right? Yeah, yeah, right, yeah. In general, like, you know, uh, while sometimes, you know, outside venues like that one, it is picturesque, you know, like it's nice to be at and pleasant and everything. It's harder to break a sweat when you're out stage, <laughs> outside on stage. And we, you know, when you are on stage as a performer, like, you should sweat. The audience should sweat too. So I don't know. I, I guess right now in general, I'm just feeling very nostalgic and missing uh, being at indoor closed spaces with large groups of people and it being semi-safe at least, you know? And it's a, it's a long way from, I'm sure you even miss performing in a laundromat. <laughs> I would gladly play every day of this week in a laundromat if I could play in a laundromat. <laughs> So when you do come to San Diego, you have a, a strange connection with our town in that uh, you have uh, one of San Diego's greatest drummers ever uh, performing with you, Adam Willard. So does Adam Willard take you around and, and share things about San Diego when you're visiting? <laughs> no, but I'm going to ask him why he doesn't more often. I'm going to be like, hey, you know, you kind of been like, you know, I feel like you need to promote San Diego more. But um I, I agree with you with uh, it, your, your statement about him being one of the greatest drummers from San Diego, if not California, if not all of the United States. Exactly. Well, over the years, I've had the privilege of seeing you perform from a uh, little record in stores and uh, bigger shows, obviously. And uh, I've always just had the greatest time at these performances all these years. You know, I remember hearing about this young kid and and just this thing that you were doing when you were first performing, going back to the laundromats and this, this aesthetic and this ethic you had and the energy I was hearing about these shows, you know, like I'm getting chills now imagining what it might have been like at a laundromat. I know I've seen you um, in a smaller venue uh, before here in San Diego, but that whole thing that I was hearing about, you know, this is obviously before everything was blowing up too much on the internet, but um, it's been so wonderful to follow your career all the way through the Devouring Mothers, and of course this new album, Stay Alive, which I'm asking, I guess because of COVID, you were really gonna go into doing a, an Against Me album, but that kind of got trifected into a new album that you do everything on the new album, Stay Alive, correct? Yeah, you know, nothing about this year, uh, I would say has gone according to plan. I started out the year thinking that I was going to be making a record with Against Me. That's, you know, was all of our intentions. And um, we had been working in and out of the studio in January and February and, and then in March too. And we left on a tour, got three shows into the tour and had to, had to cancel the tour because of, you know, because of the virus. And came home and kind of spent like a month on the couch as I watched like, you know, plan after plan after plan that we had lined up for the year get canceled and realize like, okay, I'm, I'm not sure what this means. And, you know, as a band, none of us live in the same cities or in the same state. So it soon became clear that like, you know, even working on a record wasn't going to be possible um, while this was happening. Like three or four of us are parents. So just, you know, the idea of like people risking lives to travel to another state so we could get into a room to play music seemed like, okay, that's, you know, obviously unreasonable, 
but then at the same time, like the idea of like, okay, well, what does that mean? Like that I'm just not going to do anything until like a pandemic's over that, that seemed equally unacceptable. Um, so like on the one hand, you know, like I am a touring musician and a performer, but on the other hand, like I'm an artist, I'm a songwriter and that aspect of what I do can still be done from home or from here in Chicago. And all it took was just like, you know, kind of, kind of adjusting perspective and approaching it in a different way and realizing limitations. So working within limitations and the unfortunate limitation of this record was that you can't make it with a brand band. It wasn't like a desire of like, Oh, I don't want to make a record with my band right now. It's just like, this is the reality of the circumstances we're all living in. And so, you know, seeing, seeing nothing but news reports about being, being jobs about music, you know, uh, in the music industry being in shambles, like venues closing and everything like that. Again, the idea of like not working when you can work just seemed unacceptable. So I had songs that had been working on with against me, but at the same time, we weren't like in a place where we felt like, oh, we have the record and we're ready to record it. So when it happened, I kind of just took a look at the songs I had and was like, you know, I, I think there's just a record here. And if I just approach it differently and record it here in town, I can still make a record. And so that's what I did, you know? And I just really wanted, I wanted to make something that was more like a document, like of the period of time, true to the period of time, you know, that we're all just going through and living. In. Where did you record this album? Tell everybody, this was a new, uh, new person you worked with, I believe, right? Yeah, I, I recorded the record at Electrical Audio here in town, which is Steve Albini's studio, recorded with Steve Albini. Um, Steve Albini has like a you know, track record that speaks for itself, having made records with everyone from Nirvana to the Pixies to PJ Harvey to his own band Shellac, you know. Um, but specifically, uh, Steve is an analog recording engineer, and I wanted to make an analog record. I didn't, I wanted to make a, a record that was a, the polar opposite of a Zoom call. And yeah. it was astonishing how quick everything switched over to Zoom calls and live streams once the pandemic hit. And I felt like supreme anxiety over that, you know, and I'm, I'm grateful for the connection that it offers and everything like that. But the, the feeling that nothing lasting is made from it gives me anxiety. And so, you know, as a musician, like I never, I'd never set out to be a, a live streaming performer. You know, that was never my, my goal in life, you know, it was like, I want to be really good at live streaming. Like I want to be in a band and I want to tour and I want to play shows for people and I want to record music. So again, I just wanted the recording experience that was more making something real. Like I wanted to leave the studio holding physical tapes that had a record on it that you know, was quantifiable in that way. And that also like was not open to manipulation when it comes to editing and fixing mistakes, you know, like going into the studio really practiced and just singing the songs and playing the songs and having it being again, an accurate representation, like a document of that period of time of this past summer during a pandemic, you know, so that I could look back on this time and be like, well, what did I do during the pandemic? I made a record, you know, like there was a lot of limitations that I had as far as like, you know, right now this week, I haven't left my apartment in five days, <laughs> you know, um, that's, that's crazy to, to, to like feel like, you know, what am I doing with this year of my life? I'm just sitting inside, like, you know, granted, I should add on to that. I broke my foot two weeks ago. So I'm like, how did you break your foot? I was playing in the woods with some friends and their kids and one of the kids was trying to break tree branches and half dead tree branches and throw them into a river. So I was just playing with the kid and kicking tree branches. And I jumped on a tree branch while wearing a pair of Vans and like landed funny and um, just immediately felt pain and knew I did something wrong. So I broke my foot. I broke my fifth metatarsal. Um, but so, yeah, you know, again, like I'm, you know, I'm stuck inside right now and I'm in this apartment and we're under a stay at home advisory here in Chicago. So even if I didn't have a broken foot, technically the city doesn't even want me being out and about and there's nowhere to go anyways. So like approaching how to make the most out of your time creatively, given your circumstances and circumstances that are out of your control, like thinking like, well, what can I control right now? What good can I do right now? Other than just sitting here, you know? That's what I'm doing right now. I'm supporting your new record, Stay Alive. And I'm in the same place. Like, my world i work uh, not only in radio but i help uh, local bands and, and music venues like the the casbah and of course there's no shows happening so so much of my world is has evaporated but uh, 
Um, I'm finding a bright light today because I'm getting to talk to you. So thank you so much for this. Um, nice I wanted to ask about the, uh, the the songwriting. So you wrote these songs over the like. Have, some, have you been sitting on some of these, or are they really been written in the, in the pri like the months prior to you going in and recording? They were all written in the months prior, like at the time that Against Me was last in the studio, we had like 30 to 35 songs that we were working through. But again, like none of it felt like, oh, well, this is the record, you know, we know what we're doing. It's just a second until we record. If we had been closer, we just would have probably gone ahead and recorded the record, even given this, the circumstances. But we just didn't, we didn't know what we were going to do yet. We just weren't planning on being ready yet, you know, no, no, no drama or anything. It's just the way it was. And so, you know, once, once it all happened, though, with that many songs, you know, it kind of became apparent of like, okay, well, what realistically, what are we talking about here? Like, is it going to be a year till we can get back in the room together? Is it going to be two years? If, in two, if it's two years, are we really going to want to just pick right up where we left off? Like, hey, everybody, let's jump into these 35 songs that we had that we weren't totally clicking on and just get right back into it. No, you know, if it's going to be two years, we'll want to start fresh and want new energy and like, you know, want it to feel relevant to two years later. But so then, you know, it's you're stuck with this weird, like questionable, okay, well, what about these songs that I have right now? They're good songs. I don't want to just throw away two years worth of songwriting. And then again, that's when I was like, I think there's just already a record, like, and I should just, you know, reapproach. Like sometimes the circumstances define a record and they make the record where if it were different circumstances, the record wouldn't have come together. And it's the same with like the energy in the room when you're in a studio with the takes, with everything. Like you just have all these circumstances that come together that really make things. And it isn't always about just like, oh, were those the right lyrics? Were those the right chords? You know, like it's it's the overall vibe and the overall direction and the overall aesthetic behind the um, the impetus of why you're doing something. So again, it just became clear of like, you know, like from a very genuine place of like, what could I be doing right now with my life that would feel positive and make me feel good as a human being, even selfishly, oh, it'd be going into the studio and recording a record because I can, I can sure. do that. And if, you know, like any, any kid who's a rock and roller who, you know, has dreams of being able to do like stuff like that will tell you like, why wouldn't you do that if you could do that? So, you know, that's what I did. Are you a fan of, of Woody Guthrie? Is he an inspiration into your creative process at all? Of course, yeah. You know, I, I, I think like every year I revisit his, uh, his list of New Year's resolutions. I don't know if you've seen that. Like it's like 40 or 50 resolutions long and it's really like genuine stuff like drink less coffee or stuff like that I really relate to that I make resolutions with as well. But especially, you know, start of against me era like growing up in the protest movement and the activist scene where woody guthrie still has like a huge impact um you know yeah forever Did you protest this summer at all or were you pretty much sticking to the the covid rules uh, and and staying in <laughs> I did. I, it was, you know, it was beyond, beyond the COVID rules. Like that was uh, of course concerning, you know, when it came to being in uh, out there with large groups of people, but, um, but being a parent too, you know, of like bringing your kid into a protest, even if there wasn't a pandemic going on, like there's a certain amount of apprehension, but uh, I, you know, we went to a specific, a friend of mine organized a protest in the suburbs um that we went to that was like a family protest which was really great because it was a wide array of of different age group kids uh that were a part of it and kind of felt like oh cool we're like teaching a younger generation to be out there and protest but and then there was you know in my neighborhood there would be like a weekly um on the week on every sunday like demonstration at the corner i can see right outside of my window that we'd walk over to and hold signs and you know people would honk or whatever um but it was like an undeniable feeling of wanting to be involved in everything that was happening over the summer and trying to grapple that with like, okay, well, what's realistic for me, what's safe for me or whatever. But then, you know, applying that to making a record of feeling like you, you recognize like that, okay, there's something happening. I want to be a part of what's happening, but while I would really like to be out on the streets because that's immediately gratifying, like that's not the only way there is to be a part of it and to make a difference. Like there's so many people that for so many reasons who can't go out and be out on the streets and protest, but who can still effectively be a part of the protest and what's happening. And, you know, whether that's like using your platform to raise other voices or to address issues in songwriting or whatever, you know, 
making sure you're making an effort there um, was definitely important to me over the summer. Is Stay Alive a protest album? It seems much more positive and hopeful than that. Well, I mean, like even, you know, on, on the base level, like it, in a way to me, it felt like an act of protest where like there's a pandemic raging, <laughs> you know, democracy is apparently collapsing. Everything outside this apartment feels like it's telling me like, hey, you, you might die. This might be the time. And so to take this defiant attitude of like, no, stay alive. Um, and, and, you know, I'll tell you, like uh, part of the impetus for the album title uh, came from it came from a couple different places. But a, a friend of mine named Chris Farron, he put out a record called uh, Can't Die. And this was a couple years back, three, four years ago. And we were touring together and he gave me a hat, like just a, a ball cap that says can't die across it. And that became my running hat. I'm an avid runner when I don't have a broken foot. But so every morning that I'd wake up and wouldn't feel like running and just like, you know, kind of feeling run down and I'd put on that hat that said can't die. It almost became like my response to it, like can't die, stay alive. You know, where you're like, you're defying the fates. So it's a defiant record, if not a protest record. What's with the bowl of roaches? Um, it, you know, I quit smoking cannabis for the record. I like felt like that was another, you know, when talking about things that you can do um, in your own world, like thinking, thinking globally, but acting locally, uh, considering everything that was going on, considering everything that I'm talking about, like a sacrifice that I felt like I could made and make in my personal life was, okay, I can quit smoking cannabis, you know, from a, from a budgeting aspect of being like, all right, I'm a musician right now. I, my, my job's been chopped in half. I can't go out on the road. I can't tour, you know, like, where can I make savings? Where can I make sacrifices? Uh, where can I be more austere? I can quit smoking cannabis. And then also like, even just from, you know, uh, the fear of like, okay, this is a respiratory disease that we're facing. And if I'm smoking, like, you know, how much cannabis, like every week, like, that's not good. And, um, you know, and that, that's not to say that, like, I don't disbelieve in, in the value of, of cannabis, especially medicinally, you know, like, and personally, having used it just for anxiety issues and everything like that, like, I still see the benefit, but it's about like making adjustments and making sacrifices within your life when approached with an extreme situation. But so anyways, that was all the, the roaches from that last, uh, last eighth of weed that I smoked. And I just had them all there in my ashtray and took a photo of it. And, you know, and just trying to get more meaning out of something where if it wouldn't have been for that photo, and if it wouldn't become the album cover, that just would have been an eighth of weed that I smoked and all these roaches gone. But now it's an eighth of weed that I smoked that became an album cover. So it, the, you know, the eighth paid for itself is basically what I'm saying. <laughs> is it legal? Uh, can you go to a store? Do they have cannabis shops in, in Chicago? Yeah, it's fully legal here. Okay. You know, it, it's totally legal here. Uh, but it's, it, it was legalized like officially a year ago, uh, recreationally or whatever. Sure. But it, it's been like slow to catch up where most of the shops like have, because of low supply are only open to medicinal um, and then they like do it a dumb way where you have to like go in and pay in one building and then walk to a different building to, huh. to get given the cannabis. It's so stupid. Um, it, it's ridiculous because like the city's facing all these mad, massive budget problems right now and they're like raising property taxes and all this stuff. And it's like, hey, just sell more cannabis and tax it. <laughs> like, exactly. Problem solved for everyone, you know? They're everywhere here in California now. It's like going in, I'm like a kid in a candy store. I got to go check out each one. It's, it's, it's fascinating to me. I thought I would have to go to Amsterdam as a, as, a, as a young kid growing up in the 80s, but now it's in my backyard. It really has been in California for years. Uh, yeah. So I was fascinated to find out how mainstream Laura Jane Grace really truly is. This is something I didn't actually know, and you, you mentioned it earlier. You're featured in Runner's World. Were you on the cover, or was that just a feature article? In Runner's World, who would, who would think that? That's really cool, actually. And, and just like you open up yourself to inspiring so many people in, in what you do and how you act, but then you're also this now this health advocate who actually hated running as a young person, but you found running um, mostly during COVID or were you a runner slightly before that? I got into running when I was like 24 years old, 24 or 25. That was like the first period of time in my life where I realized I was really unhealthy 
And, you know, I've been living in a college drinking town and just, you, you go from those teenage years into your early 20s thinking like nothing phases me. And then you're like, a couple of years later, you're like, oh, it does phase me. This is taking a toll. But so I first discovered running then and, you know, on and off over the years, I've, I've come back and forth to it. And within the last like five years in particularly, I got really back into it um, and just kind of learned Chicago that way, you know, and uh, became a regular part of my routine. And I turned 40 two weeks ago and my ideal way, again, like nothing of this year has gone according to plan, but my original plan for, the, for this year was I, was I was signed up and registered to run the Chicago Marathon this past October, yeah. um, the 18th or whatever. So I'd been training for that, all ready for that. And then, you know, obviously the, the marathon got, got canceled this year. So my entry is pushed next year. I'm still like entered, but that was my whole thing. It was like, I want to run the marathon before I turn 40. Like, I, I know I'm not going to win or anything. I just <laughs> want to run. But, um, you know, got, know. got really into running. And, uh, and so that, that opportunity came up with this record to talk about it with Runner's World. I don't think it's the cover. I haven't actually gotten sent the physical issue yet, but it is a feature in there. I read it. And, it was great. Um, it's cool. I like talking about running, you know, like, and I, um, I, I, you know, again, missing, having a broken foot right now, I'm so super bummed about yeah, not I being can imagine. the one thing keeping me sane. <laughs> Do you have a treadmill in the house too, or? I don't. I have like a, I have a bike, like a Peloton bike or whatever. So I've been doing that. Like I can still do that with my foot, still get cardio. Circulation is important when uh, healing a foot, but um, I don't know, you know, trying to focus on stuff like that has been a real lifesaver for me during this time. Like I, I, I'm, you know, I live in a big city, but I'm pretty isolated in that I've been a touring musician for 20 years. So like, it's not like that I don't have friends or community. It's just that my friends and my community are spread out across the world because I'm accustomed to seeing the, you know, yeah. I'm accustomed to seeing friends in San Diego at least once or twice a year, yeah. you know, friends in LA at least once or twice a year. So coming back here to Chicago, I'm just like, I don't know anyone here really. And also now is certainly not the time to go out and meet people. Meet so, you know, focusing on those things that you can do on your own that are positive, like, positive outlets are, are pretty crucial right now. I washed all five of my dogs today. That was something positive I did. They're all very happy and clean. <laughs> very nice. Um, so we got the new album that has been available digitally, but it officially comes out uh, in, in, in vinyl, compact disc, eight track, cassette, whatever people uh, use as their format. But it's officially going to be out in physical copies uh, in the next week or so? On December, like, uh, December 14th, I think is when it comes out. Yeah, physically. It's like pre-order now and digital. Polyvinyl, it's cool that Polyvinyl does it this way. I like the advanced digital release. It feels like right now that there's no reason to wait for stuff. And like, you know, the, the idea of adhering to some kind of old school way you do things of like, you know, you, you release a single, you announce the tour, the album comes out, you go out and do the tour. It's like, well, no one's touring right now. Everyone, you have this captive audience. Like there's no point not to share music with people, especially if it's just gonna make people happy, if it's gonna make you happy as an artist. Um, but I'll tell you one, one other cool thing about it is that this, is, this record has been entirely made in Chicago in that it was like written here in Chicago, it was recorded here in Chicago at Electrical Audio. It was mastered at Chicago Mastering Service. And then it was physically pressed at a record plant here in Chicago called Smash Plastic. <laughs> so I got to like go down to the record plant um, in off hours when there weren't employees there and just even like see the machines that are making the records. But it's cool to have it so contained. Um, whereas usually, you know, it's like so spread out. We're like, I mean, we've had records pressed in you know, the Czech Republic or, sure. or like in Nashville or wherever, you know, like all over the place and to have it all made locally is pretty neat. I don't know. Yeah. Well, you're a DIY kind of person, you know, you used to make zines. You're just, you're of that aesthetic of, of what I've always admired in, in music. And, and, you know, we've lost so much of that. I, I don't know if the younger generations, you know, get what we got to grow up with and it's all changed so much. And I appreciate those days. And, the hustle you went through and you know my own life experience i've got a few years on you but uh it's been great to, to just follow your career and, and see you do weird and crazy and unusual different things um i think didn't you do a, a collaboration with miley cyrus i did yeah i um 
Me, Miley Cyrus, and Joan Jett, actually. Yeah. It, it was for Miley's uh, charity organization called the Happy Hippie Foundation. Uh, she had me and Joan come out and uh, basically set up her band in her backyard around her swimming pool. And we just <laughs> all hung out and, and jammed and recorded some songs. It was like one of the most surreal days of my life. And I, I had been doing so much traveling at the time. I had like flown from Japan to Florida, then Mexico, Boston, and then ended up in California in Miley Cyrus's backyard. But I mean, she couldn't have been a more gracious host and just like a sweeter person. And it was a super fun time. Like any opportunity I've ever had to hang out with Joan Jett has been like in my coolest days alive. So thankful for that too. <laughs> yes, uh, Joan was a big inspiration for you growing up. I know Crass was, I love that. Uh, but what other artists that maybe people wouldn't know were big inspirations? Uh, for I, you know, I, I like followed trends in a strange way in that I didn't, I wasn't influenced by MTV until middle school because I was a military brat, grew up overseas um, and around army bases where there just wasn't American television, you know, at all. Right, right. So, like, I got into like metal and like, you know, hair bands in the 80s, um, Guns N' Roses, Skid Row, Bon Jovi, stuff like that I loved, you know, and U2 at the same time while also listening to a healthy dose of MC Hammer and New Kids on the Block. But like Guns N' Roses were that first band for me that hit me. And, um, you know, Axel was probably my first vo vocal inspiration where I was like, I want to sound like that person. Like their voice sounds like broken glass and just like so amazing. But then I, you know, kind of went backwards in time with my group of friends where we got into the classic rock bands after that of like Pink Floyd, Led Zeppelin, The Beatles, The Doors, you know, Led, you know all that. And then, then right after that was when grunge really hit and, Nirvana, you know, he would huge influence, Pearl Jam, huge influence. Um, and then kind of segued nicely, you know, Green Day was my first show I ever went to right when Dookie was blowing up like 1994 in South Florida. Um, and then went into punk rock from there, pretty deep dive into punk rock, you know, and started out with the bands everyone else starts out with, Sex Pistols, The Clash, The Misfits, Dead Kennedys, and then went into like much more obscure, um, you know, 80s peace punk English bands like uh, Crass, Flux of Pink Indians, The Mob, Omega Tribe. And, uh, and, and then, you know, just like, it, it's funny how like everything used to be so regional where, you know, like you were into the UK peace punk scene or there was like a grindcore like punk scene happening in Minneapolis in the mid nineties, late nineties. Sure. So there was like the East Bay punk scene or yeah. even San Diego punk scene with, you know, like Rocket from the Crypt drive like Jay who like all these bands that amazing bands that it used to feel so much more regional and there'd be periods of time where those regions would be bigger you know or where it's really happening that's kind of not the same anymore definitely with you know internet era um uh but I'm thankful to have experienced that uh but then you know like I started playing in punk bands for my first bands and and really like I started against me when I was 17 and that really like you know that took off when I was probably like 20 years old and that's 20 years later here we are you know did you ever like ska were you ever into ska or I did, did. Yeah. I still very much like ska I don't know about all the different like waves of revival but like I've I've skanked at a special show that's, that's like, what I love <laughs> there's like maybe three shows I've ever skanked at the specials Magadog and uh, this band called Bacone Dulce, who were a Florida ska band. But, uh, you know, ska in Florida, especially in the 90s, Tampa scene was, was huge. And um, old school ska music, like, there's no better hang music where you're just like a group of people sitting in a backstage on a bus or wherever on the road. And if someone just puts on a little ska in the background, instantly chill, you know? I was a rude boy in the 80s, so I love all the two-tone ska stuff. Yeah. All right, I got a couple questions off of a, a Facebook post I did. Um, what is your current favorite guitar from my buddy Johnny Koch? Current favorite guitar? Um, I jump back and forth on this a lot. <laughs> uh, I, I'll tell you, I have this like white, um, nothing special about it Stratocaster that I enjoy playing at home. Anytime I've ever tried to play it live, it does not work out for me. Just where the selector switch is, the pickup selector switch, like I knock into it, something uh -huh. about my, my live stance, but live doesn't really matter anymore, um, or at least right now. So at home, I really enjoy playing this white Stratocaster. <laughs> so that's my current favorite guitar, but you know. 
Let's see. Uh, let's see. They put out original cowboy, total clarity, and black crosses. Is there any plans to put out old wave? <laughs> well, I, you know, maybe, possibly. I don't know if we'll be able to do it under that name. New Wave is the only record that's like not in our control. So all the all the demos and stuff like that that were written around that time are still owned by Warner Brothers. So that's the only record that we probably can't do stuff like that with. But at the same time, you know, th this period of time right now has been so great for like going and getting caught up on things that I've neglected for years, whether that's like cleaning out my basement, cleaning out a storage unit or going through old archives and like organizing archives and, and taking into account like, oh, this is what we actually have sitting around. And I've definitely done a lot of that. And we definitely do have a lot of like, just even unreleased songs, old demos, whatever that are around that I imagine we'll do something with sooner than later. Is there gonna be a Broken Foot album? Because you're just <laughs> sitting around healing, you might as well write the Broken Foot album. There could be very well. I, you know, it's funny. I was like thinking about that last night. I was working in my office and working on some songs and just like, you know, there's such an, I, I feel like such an attitude right now of like, oh, well, what does it matter? There's no rules. Like I can just do whatever I want. But sometimes I get so far out there with what I'll be working on, you know, like, like I was writing the song last night about like, I haven't left my apartment in five days, just like repeating that line over and over again. And I was like jamming on it, but I was like, I can't share this with people. This is <laughs> good. Without smoking any weed, your dreams must be really significant too. So Obviously, there's a lot of new things going on in your head, I would imagine uh, that, yeah. Spark. Yeah, that's for real. And, you know, that was something that really hit me. I was going through reading a lot of, like, books about psychology not too long ago, and they were talking about, you know, this specific type of therapy. I forget what it's called right now, where uh, it basically, basically is rapid eye movement therapy and how, like, when your brain goes into REM sleep, your subconscious is processing things you go through. And how when I smoke a lot of cannabis, like I just do not dream. That's always been one of the perks of it in a way, anyways, because I'll, I'll tend to have nightmares. Uh, but the idea of like, okay, how long have I been not like processing my subconscious? And so to go through a period of time now where like kind of, again, catching up on all those things, you know, cleaning out the mind as well as cleaning out the closet and cleaning up the archives. <laughs> <laughs> I want to thank you so much. You're uh You've made me a better human being, really, honestly, just with your openness and forthrightness and just how you've handled yourself. And it gives me a better understanding and acceptance. So I just thank you for that. That's uh, been a beautiful thing. Um, I've, I've, I've had the chance to chat with you over the years. Uh, one of my favorites was uh, I was working for another radio station and we were just sitting on the couch at uh, a house out in Palm Springs. It was a Coachella festival and the band had been brought by and we were just having this great conversation on the couch and that's always stuck, stuck out in my mind. And you've always been a, a wonderful, gracious human being and to my friends and to my wife and anybody that we've ever uh, encountered you. So I wish you the best and, and people get the new album, Stay Alive, Polyvinyl Record. I wanna thank uh, Rob Wilcox, he's a, he's a cool dude. Do you know Rob personally? I do, yeah. Mm -hmm. He's a crazy little sucker, isn't he? I love that little dude. He always has a very positive attitude, which I really appreciate. It makes a difference, you know? I live my life like that, too. And uh, I needed this today because with all this weirdness and craziness, you know, my world has, uh, has shrunk down quite a bit, much like yours. And uh, this was just a, a great thing for me today to get to talk to you. So, Laura Jane Grace. Thank you. I appreciate it. My pleasure. And please, because it showed up on the Zoom, and I, I know her name is, is I, I would have had this in my notes, but please give your daughter Evelyn a hug. I think it's so funny we're using the computer that your daughter Evelyn does all of her Zoom uh, classes on. So I'm sure she needs to get back to school, right? Um, yeah, I actually, well, see, I've, it's funny, her birthday was not too long ago and I got her like a, 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 a Chromebook because she had taken over all of my electronics. And <laughs> she like was using my computer for school and then would use my iPad to FaceTime with friends and then started asking me for my phone too. So I was like, all right, enough. Like now you, you need your own computer now. So we're, we're good. But yeah, I still have yet to correct it over from this. I, I found that amazing. I thought that was, who's Evelyn? But <laughs> Laura Jane Grace, everybody. And uh, thank you so much. The new album is great. Last thing I actually did want to ask before I do let you go, because I was so fascinated by this. People haven't heard the album yet. I don't know if that was me getting close. No, to the it, it was me. <laughs> but um, there's a great thing. If you want to listen to the album, 
if you want to witness Lord Jane Grace in the bathtub, is that still up there? That I was fascinated by that. It's the whole album, and it's you in the bathtub. <laughs> yeah, that's a, for the live stream for Mirror that happened on YouTube. I basically just filmed me in the bathtub for 30 minutes. That's how long the, the, the video is, or the, how long the record is. Um, and so I just read a book in the bath while everyone had a listening party. I've, I've spent an enormous amount of time in the bathtub over quarantine. Self-care is very important right now. Bathtub is my happy place. Reading a book, bubble bath, can't get much better than that. So I was like, this is a perfect way to share the record with people. And that's a great way for people to experience it, but get it, it is out available on hard copies very soon and you can stream it. I suggest streaming the video of Laura Jane Grace in the bathtub. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, thank you, that's awesome. 91X.